So it's my pleasure to moderate this panel, which um, explores um, questions of, you know, whether the web and digital platforms can be used to kind of create community and support community, uh, and what are the sort of affordances and limitations of uh, that that sort of uh, way of working with the web. Um, and there's been a uh, change to the scheduled program, which is that uh, two of our presenters are actually um, have fallen sick and are unable to participate today. So um, we're working with a little bit of a um, skeleton crew, but that'll be, I think, to our advantage, ultimately. Uh, my name is Michael Connor. I'm Artistic Director of Rhizome. Um, up first, we will have uh, Olga Boychuk, uh, who's presenting about mediatizing war, um, digital media, and the battlefronts. And I'm um, going to, yeah, and uh, this the second presentation will be Reclaiming Visibility After Sexual Assault, Lessons from Sexual Assault Survivors' Use of Social Media for Designing Digital Supportive Spaces um, by Kristen Barta. Um, so without further ado, I think we should get started. Um, come on up, Olga. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so this is an outcome of... Uh, of a collaboration among three Ukrainians. Uh, my name is Olga Boychak. I am a PhD candidate at Syracuse University. Uh, I study social science. My dissertation is about uh, mediatized warfare and civic participation in mediatized warfare. And uh, my uh, legendary collaborators, Daria Marchenko and Daniel Green, they are Ukrainian artists. Their work uh, touches upon the materiality of hybrid warfare. And we are going to be talking about mediatized warfare and we're going to be approaching it through the notion of assemblages. Assemblages are historically situated objects that draw together people, events, places, technologies uh, by the relations of power. And so a a theory and art are uh, ways of making sense of a social reality. So in this presentation, we try to fuse theory and art to explain the nature of, uh, of mediatized warfare and to think about the role the digital media play in modern day military conflicts. Uh, so first, when we talk about mediatization, uh, these are higher order processes of societal transformation, uh, which are driven by technology-based interdependence. On the one hand, there's rapid technological advancement. On the other hand, is humans in increasing reliance on these digital tools. Uh, and as an outcome, it not only mediates, but this reliance not only mediates, but also restructures uh, the social interrelations that are uh, relying on this media. So mediatization is a higher order process where uh, social, human sociality is getting uh, restructured by its reliance on digital technologies. And so uh, mediatization has uh, uh, touched many uh, social domains, including family life. Uh, we rely on media when we communicate with our family, but also other social domains such as governance, uh, healthcare, economy, and one of these social domains that got uh, restructured by mediatization is war. Uh, so what happens is that by uh, the virtue of its reliance on the digital tools, um, do social domains started converging and overlapping. And so this uh, presentation is situated at the overlap between more war and media nexus. And as I will be trying to show that it um, destroys the military-civilian divide that uh, used to exist in the military operations, and it enables uh, civilian participation in the military affairs. Uh, this is uh, the first assemblage. It's part of the Five Elements of War um, collection by uh, Daria and Daniel. Um, this is a grenade. So Daria and Daniel, uh, they uh, construct art uh, from the objects found in the Ukrainian war zone. And this uh, object is called, this assemblage is called the brain of war. So it uh, intends to depict the role of digital media in modern day warfare. As you see, this is a grenade and there's lots of cameras facing all the way. So it's not only, it not only shows cyberspace as a site for military operations, but it also shows kind of the different angles that could be taken at what is going on at the battlefronts. And so that is, um, how um, they see the hybridity of the warfare that's going on in Ukraine and in other parts of the world. Uh, so we're going to talk about hybrid warfare or mediatized warfare. Uh, this is another, uh, this uh, assemblage is called Man Shall Money. 
and showing the uh, war machine uh, and depicting the military hierarchies of, um, of the war. All these parts are made of bullet shells and shrapnel, and there's money of different countries of the world. But if you zoom in, you see that each soldier becomes kind of faceless, and that is the um, dominant paradigm how we see uh, warfare. But as we're going to be trying to show uh, today, it, it's a little bit more complex than that. So on our agenda, we want to know, um, first of all, where are the battlefronts in the modern day warfare? If it's mediatized, um, where does the war take place? Then second question is who gets to be a soldier in a mediatized war? Uh, as we know, there's since, since the virtual space, the online sphere has become a site of, um, of military operations, since the information warfare is now um, a concept that's being widely used in regards to this kind of uh, um, uh, military conflicts, uh, then who really gets to be a soldier? Can civilians really participate in military conflicts if they're mediatized? And also, uh, given the recent um, tendencies that happened in the, with the computational propaganda online, we can also ask what gets to be a soldier because a lot of these efforts are um, computational and it, might, it doesn't necessarily have to be a human that is behind a military effort of a state. And the third question is, is there really a military-civilian divide? That's what we read in the literature, that's what, especially during the uh, 2004 war in Iraq, uh, we had a lot, there's, there were interviews by especially the military that uh, claimed that there's a military-civilian divide. Uh, as we know, the CNN effect, which basically made the country's foreign policy reliant on the public opinion, um, claimed that there was this divide between what's really going on at the battlefront and what the public is thinking, and how the battlefront events are depicted to the public through the media. And so uh, we would like to question that uh, military-civilian divide and show that, in fact, a military conflict is much messier, especially if it's mediatized. Um, this is another assemblage. Uh, it's called Honor. Uh, it is an eye that's seeing outside in the international uh, realm, but also inside. So uh, the white part of the eye has been made from the text of the Budapest Memorandum, uh, which was a 1994 agreement that uh, guaranteed Ukrainian territorial sovereignty in exchange of its um, surrendering uh, its nuclear weapons. And these are the shoulder straps uh, of all the, of the military of the countries that were signatories of that Budapest Memorandum. So there's France, there's the, the Great Britain, there is China and there's the US, Russia and Ukraine. And so this, is, this just depicts the uh, international norms that govern warfare and how uh, the countries, the military, which were, um, there is a, uh, they, are, they see themselves as a very honorable, uh, as very honorable and how the, um, so how they failed to, um, to stick to the commitment of uh, protecting the Ukrainian territory and there's also bullets and shrapnel and pieces of uh, rubble that was found um, in um, eastern Ukraine. And this is also the, uh, the middle of, of the eye is also made of bullet shells. And so the war media nexus, uh, what we're trying to say is that civilian actors can effectively participate in the military affairs of states. And uh, I'm going to show you how it is done. Uh, so when we talk about battlefront assemblages, uh, it is very very interesting to see how different um, components get drawn into this assemblage. So this Budapest Memorandum would be one example of how an international norm of law is uh, drawn into a military conflict. There's also this, um, this assemblage is called the heart of war, so there's always financial interests, but, but this uh, assemblage is mostly about the resources that go into conducting warfare. Uh, this carcass is made of uh, bullet shells, and then there's uh, the drilling uh, oil um, drills, and, and, and this shows how they pump the blood into the heart of the war. And so that is um, the way. So this is more about the resources that are uh, drawn into a, a military conflict and what it means for the people who participate in it. Uh, now, uh, let's zoom into Ukraine. Um, there is a large scale effort of self-mobilized uh, individuals that call themselves, themselves battlefront volunteers. 
that are crowdfunding uh, military and humanitarian aid uh, to help the Ukrainian army. And uh, they, they actively construct and participate in these battlefront assemblages, and they have uh, managed to generate more than $30 million um, over the past four years that the conflict has been in its active stage. And of course, the, um, the amount of money that's been generated is much higher, but this is the, we have the data to prove only this. Um, this is an example of how digital media is used by these battlefront volunteers to uh, to participate in this conflict. Um, see here, they're raising, uh, this initiative is called the People's Project, and they are raising uh, money to equip the soldiers and to provide them with different uh, goods that uh, they, they're buying quadrocopters here and, and other things. So that's just an example of how media can be used to draw civilians into a military conflict and how the civilians can organize using digital media to, um, to participate and to resist an impending occupation. Okay, these are some of the initiatives that um, have been going on in Ukraine. Uh, in relation to the military conflict, and what unites them is that most of them uh, rely heavily on digital media and were made possible by reliance on digital media. So we'll, I will just go uh, through a couple of them just to show the different kinds of things, people, events that can be brought together uh, into this conflict. So uh, there is a lot of organizations that uh, work to alleviate the soldiers' needs. In 2014, when the military conflict just started, the Ukrainian army was severely underfunded, and these initiatives, these civilians stepped in. But what's most important here is that they uh, did it horizontally. They did not cooperate with the military as, uh, as we know from the civil-military relations, that there's the military and there's the, the civil society of a country and they cooperate on a kind of vertical level. This was very much horizontal cooperation where they would just go straight to the battlefronts where they would coordinate their action with the soldiers and they would deliver uh, things to, directly to the battlefronts. That would be food, drinking water, uh, medical supplies. Uh, then automobiles, there is a big uh, initiative to bring automobiles to the battlefront. This young man, um, he's 10 years old, he's an American-Ukrainian named Daniel, uh, or Danilo in Ukrainian, and um, he ran a birthday fundraiser to purchase an SUV that he donated to the Ukrainian army. So there, that took a whole social infrastructure of people to to, uh, from the point where he gave the money to the volunteers and to the point where this SUV was delivered to the battlefront, and here's a soldier with a thank you card thanking this uh, young man for his contribution. So there's very interesting ways in which uh, people, even abroad, even 10-year-old kids can participate in this uh, in this effort. Uh, then there's also high-tech equipment that's being delivered to the Ukrainian army. Uh, there's an effort to organize the expatriation of mortal remains. Uh, the Ukrainian state is currently not um, being able to handle uh, the deaths. Um, last week, for example, there were 22 soldiers uh, who got wounded uh, in the conflict and they all needed medical help. And so all of these things are now covered by the civilian population. Uh, then veteran rehabilitation and services. Um, Tactical medicine, as it turned out, the Ukrainian army prior to 2014 did not have its own tactical medicine. So the sol there was no way to get so the medical help to the soldiers until they got to a hospital. So there is a whole initiative that is trying to bring uh, tactical medicine to the Ukrainian army that are running trainings, that are supplying them with equipment. Uh, to make first aid possible. And they're also tackling civilians in the conflict zones because there's very scarce access to medical resources. Uh, also, high-precision tactical GIS mapping. There is a very interesting initiative that uh, consists of more than 100 cartographers. Uh, as it turned out, the Ukrainian army did not have very advanced cartography when the conflict started, so there's this civilian initiative to supply the army with high-precision uh, GIS maps and to supply them with tablets and to train them how to use um, these maps in their tactical operations. And also there's very impressive maker communities. There's more than 500 organizations that are helping the army through crafts, and I will talk about them later a little bit. 
This is just to showcase one of the initiatives. Uh, this is Mushko, he's a rock musician, but um, he's also a battlefront volunteer, and he's part of this um, initiative that's called the Hospitaliers. He is driving a, a military ambulance. So this initiative uh, crowdfunded to purchase these military ambulances, and here he is shown um, driving at the battlefront um, assisting um, the wounded soldiers and civilian populations in, in this conflict. And then the next one, we have Olesa, who's, um, she's an HR um, at one of the banks in Kyiv, and she um, has been helping the army through crafts. So in her case, she filmed, she was always into crafts, and when she found out that the Ukrainian army uh, did not have masking nets, um, she tried to find ways to crowdfund for them, but they could only be imported. They were really expensive. And so what she did was she uh, she figured out a way to make them from scratch, from discarded camouflage. And she filmed a video where she showed how to correctly make a masking net from fishing nets and from uh, camouflage. And that led to the creation of grassroots of over 500 organizations that uh, have been making those masking nets ever since. Uh, so, so that there's a very large making community that is participating in this conflict uh, through their crafts. There's a lot of um, retired people who gather together at their local community center and make this as, a, as their form of individual resistance to the occupation. So this is just an example. Here she is standing, uh, she's receiving an award for, for making those nets and there's, there are now festivals where they display those nets and they're sharing their know-hows and how uh, to make those. Uh, so this is pretty much to, to sum it up that um, digital media uh, does enable civilian participation in military affairs. Um, this is um, a theory project, an art project, but ultimately the stakes are political and um, perhaps there is hope that by enabling civilian participation in military affairs, digital media may become a vehicle for grassroots resistance to sophisticated military doctrines. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so, good afternoon. Um, as Michael mentioned, my name is Kristen Barta, and I am a doctoral candidate in communication at the University of Washington. So, in this presentation, um, I'm going to review a few of the strategies that survivors of sexual assault employ in disclosing sexual assault victimization in public social media spaces. Um, and I suggest that these strategies encourage us to kind of reconsider um, current models of uh, mediated social support. Um, and I focus here on the role of visibility um, as an affordance um, to begin sussing out the connections between survivors' uh, disclosure goals and social media structures. So I conclude then with a set of considerations that touch on um, our current kind of understandings of social support online um, and implications for designing supportive spaces. So talking about being sexually assaulted is incredibly difficult. Um, and although anyone can be a victim of sexual assault regardless of gender or other demographic factors, um, victims are overwhelmingly well, w women, excuse me, and men are overwhelmingly perpetrators. Um, it is violence that's made excusable by ideological tenets that delegitimize the validity of women's lived experiences um, and work to kind of silence and stigmatize um, survivorship and own it kind of being a sexual assault survivor. Um, and these have very real effects, right, and they're resulting in victim blaming, disbelief of survivors, and kind of extension of that um, underreporting. So thinking about social media, um, we've seen that these spaces can be incredibly hostile to women um, and to survivors. Um, and we've also seen that um, perpetrators of violence can actually use these spaces to continue to harass, intimidate, stalk, and otherwise harm victims. So considering this alongside research on disclosure, which I'll get to in a moment, um, this project focuses on the questions what informs survivors' decisions to publicly disclose on social media? What are their goals for doing so? And how do social media structures help survivors meet those goals? So what I'm presenting here is based on findings from about 25 participant interviews um, with survivors and is part of a larger project that considers interviews alongside social network analyses of hashtags related to rape and sexual assault. So, um, Participants in this project are individuals within the US or Canada to kind of constrain that contextual um, 
or cultural context, excuse me, um, people who have voluntarily disclosed survivorship have done so on social media and have done so on public social media profiles. And they've also chosen to, to talk to me. So the point I'm making here is that this is a very narrow segment of a much broader population. And I caution against generalizing these findings beyond this context. So disclosure um, refers to revealing personal or private information that is um, about the self and is generally unknown or unknowable from other sources. Um, in this case, focusing on disclosures that identify an individual as a victim or survivor of sexual assault um, at the very minimum and extending to kind of lengthier uh, retellings of assault experiences um, on the other end of the spectrum. What we know about disclosure is that it's deliberate. Um, people are very careful in determining um, kind of who they're disclosing to, um, especially when it's a socially stigmatized identity, um, when they disclose, um, well, or under, under what circumstances, um, how and where, so considering you know, in person, um, over the phone, or in this case on which social media platform, um, how much to disclose at a time, and for what purpose. Um, we also know that people weigh the likely outcomes of disclosing. So is this person going to have a good reaction to my disclosure? Is telling this person my story going to help me achieve my goal? Um, so you can start to understand the stakes involved in disclosing something like this publicly. And the other point that I want to make here um, is that uh, research indicates that a negative response to a disclosure of sexual assault victimization is perhaps more harmful than a positive response is beneficial. So again, really upping those stakes there. So to begin to make sense of how social media spaces help survivors meet their goals uh, for disclosure, I draw on affordances perspective. Um, an affordance is a concept that is generally credited to Gibson um, in ecological psychology in the 1970s, but has since been adopted across uh, social science disciplines, um, especially in regards to kind of understanding technology. And for the purposes of this project, I'm defining an affordance as the ability of a tool perceived by a particular actor as facilitating a particular outcome. Uh, and when applied to social media, affordances really help us think about the abilities of, of technological tools and what they can do for us. Um, they also help us think beyond features to abilities, and so kind of elevating the, the ability of social media beyond specific platforms. <clears throat> Um, common, um, uh, common affordances that are associated with social media include visibility, editability, persistence, and association. Um, anonymity is another one, and this is by no means a comprehensive list, but just to give you a sense of what affordances actually are and what they look like. Um, and the affordance I'm going to be focusing on today is visibility. So mediated visibility, um, or just media or visibility in an online context, um, is regarded as a root affordance, meaning that it is kind of foundational to making other affordances available. Um, it's also a multidimensional concept in that it is uh, relational. So visibility requires both a seer and a scene. Um, it is strategic in that individuals can leverage mediated visibility as a weapon, to use Thompson's term, um, in navigating the struggles that they face in their everyday lives. And it's also outcome driven. It's employed very strategically to kind of help achieve a goal, as is the nature of affordances. There's also a dimension of power and control to visibility. Um, and if you've ever posted something online, you can kind of understand this. Once something is online, it's online. And it is very difficult to regain control of that content. Um, the power dynamics can vary depending on context. <laughs> Excuse me. Depending on context. Um, but basically, the idea here is that disclosing something personal and intimate involves a degree of vulnerability. And that can either be leveraged kind of against an individual or be used in a, in a form of empowerment, depending on the situation. So to uh, begin understanding kind of um, how survivors employ um, visibility strategically, it's important to understand what their desired outcomes are, what their goals are for disclosure. Um, now, in my, my, my work, um, survivors reported um, a myriad of goals that kind of range from being more personal in nature to being more social in nature. And this is an imperfect division, but just to kind of begin sussing out some of these goals. Um, they range from, you know, very personally, just writing it out helps me make sense of what happened to me. Um, if I don't tell my story, it kind of leaks out. Um, and so putting it online is a way to get it out in a way that I can control. Um, and it's also empowering to say, I am a survivor. I'm here. This is my story. This is what happened to me. I'm not ashamed of it. 
there are also more social goals, right, in terms of correcting misinformation um, or informing social circles. Um, and one example I have is that um, uh, an individual reported posting publicly on Facebook to kind of the broadest reach possible of her network, um, her story, because there were rumors that were circulating about what had happened to her. And so she posted her story to correct that mis misinformation, um, to kind of tell everybody at once what had happened. And she noted that she appreciated the ability to do this on Facebook because it allowed her to tell her story once to everybody. Um, and it also allowed her to associate her story with her personal named branded profile. So this is again my story, this is how I'm telling it, this is what happened to me. The goal that I really want to focus on today for the remainder of my time is helping other survivors. Um, and helping other survivors via disclosure was um, the by far most commonly cited goal um, by my participants. And it was viewed as a way to help reduce the isolation associated with sexual assault, to help address and reduce the stigma associated with sexual assault, um, to offer a model of recovery and strength by kind of saying this is how I dealt with it, and similarly to offer kind of coping mechanisms or support to other people by saying, again, this is how I dealt with these things, this is what I experienced, it's normal to feel this way, it's normal to blame yourself, but you're not, it's not your fault, um, and kind of those aspects of disclosure that we see very commonly. <clears throat> so what's particularly interesting about helping other survivors um, is that the participants who reported wanting to help others were envisioning survivors at large. They were just envisioning other social media users kind of happening upon their content. So these are not necessarily individuals who are already within their networks, though that was also um, a, a, a case sometimes. Um, but with this outcome of helping other people and this particular audience in mind, kind of the imagined other survivor, um, visibility becomes especially key. And so there are two primary strategies that I'm going to explain today that kind of touch on um, leveraging visibility and reaching other survivors. And those are public um, and multiple profiles and hashtags. So in regards to the first, I just want to note that survivors um, negotiate visibility and its related risks by engaging other affordances strategically. So they're able to feel safer in being more public if they're able to be anonymous um, in some instances. This was not true for everybody. Again, it depends on goals. But that's one example of how being public can be kind of managed, um, or the risks of being public can be managed. Um, <clears throat> so several survivors um, who participated mentioned you know, maintaining multiple profiles, um, one that was kind of separate from their other social networks and just allow them to disclose openly in a space that was not otherwise associated with their normal kind of main primary um, platform profile. Um, and so in this way, it also helps to manage um, association, right? If none of your friends know that you have this, you're unlikely to disclose to someone that you don't want to be disclosing to. And even if you do with anonymity, they're unlikely to know that it's you and link it back to kind of who you are offline or in your other social media spaces. Um, <clears throat> regarding hashtags, um, hashtags affect visibility um, in one way by affording searchability. So you can search a hashtag, right, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Tumblr, and you can find the content that's specifically tagged with that term. Um, and this is especially useful in finding content that isn't text-based. Um, my findings indicate that um, these tags that are used by survivors are meant to be searched um, rather than intended to link related content. So this is where this phenomenon differs a little bit from things like Me Too, right? It's not about a massive uprising of, of people saying Me Too. This is about posting something so that someone else at large can find it and benefit from it. Um, and this engagement um, of being kind of a, a silo rather than in a network is uh, reflected in kind of the um, engagement with those posts. These posts typically have a very low reblog, retweet, uh, repost rate. Um, and so that's why I'm referring to this as beacons over bridges, right? It's kind of the shining light that someone else can just happen upon accidentally and benefit from. Um, hashtags also uh, can help control disclosure visibility. Um, and this is one example that I'm, I'm fascinated by, fascinated by Tumblr in general. But um, hashtags on Tumblr can function kind of as a secondary disclosure space because they help manage persistence and replicability. On Tumblr, if you post something with hashtags and someone reblogs it, those tags don't go with it. They aren't sticky to that post. Um, and there are ways around this, of course, with screenshots and other things, but generally speaking, the default 
is that those tags don't move with your content. Um, hashtag conventions on Tumblr also allow you to post kind of like full sentences as a tag. Um, and so this becomes an available disclosure space that kind of tempers the risks of, of visibility. So you can say, this is what happened to me, more details. But then when that gets shared, those details don't go with it. So again, um, these strategies that draw on affordances um, arise from platform features and, and structures, right? So you have to have um, a search function to afford searchability in some capacity. And these structures are further shaped by, by policies, um, which also affect the control that users have. And I think this is significant when you think about um, how these structures shape the stories that we're able to tell. So for instance, um, Instagram enforces community standards by rendering some tags unsearchable or banning them. Um, and it's kind of an imperfect system, right? So last time I checked, hashtag rape was unsearchable or untaggable on Instagram, but hashtag rape van was just fine. Not sure who that helps. <laughs> um, so like survivors, like many other users, are navigating systems that weren't necessarily designed with them in mind. Um, and this is where these strategies really help illustrate some of the implications for design and some of the ways that through the lens of sexual assault survivorship, we can start thinking about how to build spaces that are more supportive for individuals who are managing visibility, who are managing disclosure. So these cases also kind of trouble our understanding of um, social support, right? So disclosure is generally regarded as a precursor to support receipt, right? I have to say, I need help with this for you to then be able to support me. And that's not exactly what's happening here. These are individuals who are um, <clears throat> kind of shouting to the void saying, this could maybe help you, here it is. It's not prompted by another individual and it's not necessarily in response to a specified other in the traditional sense of social support. So social support offline is often considered dyadic, right? It's I'm telling a particular person that I have this problem to then receive support from them. And this is not that. Um, that said, um, it is targeting a specific population of individuals, right? I'm trying to help other survivors by putting this out there. So within that broad spectrum of like internet users, I'm targeting a particular subset of that group. And this is where mass personal becomes a really interesting concept here. And I won't go into it too much here, but suffice to say, mass personal is a concept, um, you can read about it in o O'Sullivan and Carr 2017, that kind of combines interpersonal and mass communication. And so it's saying, I'm shouting out to this broad audience. It's, it's a personalized message that goes kind of wide um, and just in hopes that someone that you're trying to target will see it. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, um, I'm arguing that disclosure acts in this context kind of function as supportive communication, but again, in not the ways that we're used to seeing. Um, it's also worth noting that um, uh, survivors um, or participants that I interviewed, most of them, the majority, referenced um, consulting a therapist um, or a counselor as part of their recovery process. So that might make you know, seeking support online kind of a secondary goal or a less important outcome to them. Um, and I think this draws attention to um, the ways that we need to be mindful of how online support fits into broader support systems that account for those offline supports, that account for those, those offline outlets, um, and kind of reconsider the ways that reciprocity is um, embedded within support. A um, couple more points to make here. I just want to point out that um, you know visibility, like disclosure, isn't an all or nothing binary. There are degrees of visibility, and as the hashtag example kind of alludes to, you can be strategic in determining you know not only what you disclose but how you disclose it. Um, and allowing survivors to main control, maintain control over this is incredibly important. <clears throat> we should also be mindful that being willing to disclose does not necessarily mean one is willing to receive disclosures. Um, several participants noted wanting to help other people with their experiences, but did not follow other survivor accounts or did not engage with other disclosure because they weren't ready to do so. Um, they weren't at that point in their healing process where consuming those disclosures was beneficial um, or safe for them in any way. So both visibility and expectations of reciprocity can be built into design features, um, such as naming conventions, as I've mentioned, 
um, allowing a user to maintain multiple profiles, um, separate accounts, granting um, users control over content um, and commenting, um, comment visibility, um, and comment moderation. Um, and again, these are not new features, but through the lens of sexual assault victimization and disclosure, they start to take on additional kind of meanings and implications. And the final point that I want to make is just reiterating the importance of personal outcomes. Um, I mentioned that disclosure goals are often layered between social and kind of personal goals. Um, and when the goal is, you know, reducing social stigma, these personal goals are really important in creating support. Um, and they may influence um, the importance of helping others in ways that I haven't elaborated on here. Um, the relationships between stigma, um, disclosure, support, and visibility are incredibly complex, and it would be a disservice to survivors, I feel, in designing online spaces to ignore the ways that disclosing individuals benefit by feeling safe um, enough to share their stories publicly um, and with the internet at large. Thank you. Great. If you just uh, want to both come up and have a seat, uh, let's. We can leave your work cited list up on screen while we chat, so people can copy it down. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you both so much. I wanted to start um, with a question. Well, these were both presentations that um, that dealt with, you know, extremely serious um, implications of communication on the web um, that really kind of cut to the heart of of people's survival in in. Uh, you know, highly adversarial circumstances in which um, trauma is playing a big role. And um, I was interested in, you know, how both of you had this sort of distinct approaches to that kind of um, conversation. And in particular, I wanted to start with you, Olga, and ask about um, something that we didn't get as much from your presentation was a conversation about visibility in the context of um, U Ukrainian military. And to what extent are the people that you are um, working with um, and looking at, to what extent are they having to manage visibility expectations because of the fact that you know they're in a kind of conflict situation? Thank you, Michael. So uh, visibility is very important uh, in the context of this mediatized war. And these battlefront volunteers that I'm studying, they are practically the only ones who are maintaining the visibility of the military conflict in the information environment in Ukraine and abroad. So when the uh, when the state uh, mass media are not as active in, in covering what is going on at the battlefronts, it is the volunteers that are using the affordances of, of Facebook uh, essentially to showcase uh, their efforts and to showcase what is going on at the battlefronts. So, so is visibility only a good? Because I think that was one of the things I was wondering about. Well, so that's there's a question for whom, right? Uh, so it is uh, it is not great for the uh, for the military command because that exposes a lot of systemic issues that are present in the Ukrainian army that are preventing the Ukrainian army from effectively running the military operations. And so that is being exposed and it's not, it's definitely not a good uh, thing for, for the military command, but it's good for the soldiers because the soldiers then get the aid that they need. Have you seen cases where Facebook users that were providing support to the military were then targeted um, by the kind of other sides? Yes, they have been targeted. There's um, there's a trolling effort to block their accounts. So a lot of the activists had their accounts blocked um, because other users complained that they were uh, explicit content, uh, on uh, yeah hate speech. Like there's a there is a lot of um, there were a lot of instances when their accounts got blocked because of these allegations that were not true, but that nonetheless were effective in blocking them from, from the public sphere online. Um, one of the things that really comes across in your presentation, um, Kristen, is the fact that because of the particular needs of survivors, um, the ways in which they're communicating on Facebook is in some ways counter to the design of the platform. Um, can you talk a bit about um, whether blocking played a role in the people that you spoke to because of things like creating multiple accounts is like explicitly against terms of service? Um, so that puts survivors in a very vulnerable position. And um, yeah, were there instances where that vulnerability led to people not being able to use Facebook or, or kind of got in the way of the ability to heal as a community and connect with others? 
Um, <clears throat> so the primary platforms that I looked at in this project are Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. So Facebook was not necessarily a prim primary platform, um, although some people did end up using Facebook and disclosing on Facebook. Um, so the instances of multiple profiles that I'm speaking about are mostly on platforms other than Facebook. Um, but um, you know, blocking is, um, is certainly something that was encountered. Um, sexual assault disclosure is often um, co-present with disclosure of other issues. Um, and I had a number of participants who were survivors of sex trafficking. And they found that you know, their content was more heavily moderated when it was tagged with things about sex trafficking, sex work, and things like that. And that definitely affected um, the visibility and kind of that, that power balance, again, that was available to them. Um, on Facebook, most people who chose to identify on Facebook, I am, from my results, um, saw that kind of uh, personal branding of like the real name policy on Facebook as, as a benefit or as kind of uh, embedded within their, their outcome, um, their desired outcome. So being able to tell everyone that you personally know, all your friends, all your family in one place, and saying, you know, this is my story, um, was kind of a, a stronger impetus on Facebook than it was on other platforms. Um, so, I, so the Beacons Over Bridges concept applies more outside of Facebook, as yes. I see. That makes sense. So they're, they're able to understand Facebook's particular constraints and work with other platforms when right. they need it. Um, and so while affordances help us you know, go beyond uh, particular platforms, there are particular platform structures that make uh, goals more available. Um, and so telling your family is something you do on Facebook, it's not something you do on, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to be crass, but I had one of my, um, my uh, trafficking survivor participants mention, you know, Facebook is for family, Twitter is for twats. Um, and so survivors are deliberate in choosing which platform on which to disclose, mm -hmm. and they understand that like, there are particular contexts that are um, more appropriate or more available to disclose in across these platforms. Right. Um and you know this, so I think one of the things that, um, if I can ask one more question, that's maybe this is a little bit of a complicated one, or it's one that I don't know the answer to. But um, I wondered about the connection between the terms kind of affordances and assemblage, um, because you know my understanding of the affordance theory is really like a more traditional understanding of the tool, whereas I think the you know actor network theory has like a slightly different um, sense of the kind of what is the relationship between a tool. And I, I would, I think, um, you probably can offer both much more nuance on this, but I think that like an assemblage can be said more to like be a system that produces a kind of community. So like maybe as an assemblage, social media is producing certain kinds of war in which the military and civilian line is blurred with positive and negative consequences. And it's producing particular kinds of survivor communities, which didn't, you know, previously exist, which are both strong and vulnerable in new ways or something. So are the, are the two terms compatible, affordances and assemblage, or are there ways in which they don't work together? Uh, uh, in, as uh, I see it, in, uh, so affordances are part of the assemblages as because of mediatization, because they get to determine the ways in which uh, people engage with media in regards to the conflict. Uh, they do, in fact, create new modes of engaging. So, so they are an integral element of, as in, as in Latour, as in um, Latourian view of, of affordances, they uh, create a specific environment that enables certain things to be possible. And a lot of, uh, I have done interviews with the Battlefront volunteers, and um, a lot of them say that they get effectively drawn into this conflict by the content that they saw on social media. So just the affordance to share the conflict into uh, to the users' networks uh, enables uh, new exposure to of, of these. So it draws in new actors that otherwise wouldn't have been participating, wouldn't care about this conflict as much. So I, that's... Okay. <laughs> Probably no one else is in the room is, ac is actually interested in that question besides me, but you continue if you... I would just echo that, that yes, I think they are compatible in that affordance is part of an assemblage. Um, uh, cultural historical activity theory, for instance, you know, specifically places objects within that kind of um, assemblage of, of goal and actor and object that's used to achieve that goal, and so I think they are compatible. Um, cool. That's all I'll say about that. Thank you. Um, we have time for questions from the audience, and also if people on the live stream want to tweet to TTW18 
hashtag TTW18, hashtag B1, then maybe someone can see if there's interesting questions on that. Um, that's the, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so anyone want to have a, a question for our pr presenters? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, after you say it, I'll repeat it so the, the live stream can hear. Probably for both of you, when somebody discloses that they're a particular platform-related response that they seem to prefer, do they prefer a like, do they prefer a comment, do they prefer a or a reblog or a repost? So what kinds of responses are people mostly looking for um, when they when they post? Um, it varies a lot. And I think kind of the, the broadest answer I could give is that responses are not necessarily anticipated. Um, it's more I'm putting this out there and do what you want with it. Um, on in instances of, of disclosing on, on Facebook and things, I think um, responses are not necessarily, again, desired, although um, a number of people did report uh, feeling very validated by kind of private messages to them saying, I'm really glad you shared this, it helped me, me too, um, and kind of building on that kind of sense of solidarity. Um, on, tw on Tumblr, um, you'll often see, you know, um, okay to share as a tag. And so that kind of indicates whether it's, it's okay to engage with this content in a particular way. Um, but again, many of these posts um, and many of the, of, of the participants reported that their content has very little visible engagement. Um, very few likes, although that was more common on, on Instagram um, and on Twitter. Um, very few comments, although that was more common on Facebook. Um, and very few kind of like sharing the content um, around different profiles. I would like to echo on the visible engagement because that's, that is, um, so the engagement happens uh, cross-platform. It doesn't have to happen on the platform that it initially drew that engagement. So if someone sees a Facebook post, they may as well then call the person who posted and talk to them on the phone. So when I was talking to the volunteers in, in terms of the affordances, what do you use? It is not as important as what they're doing for them. So they use any affordances that they perceive are easier, um, even face-to-face -face communication. So that is a very... It's very difficult to capture um, that engagement because it happens um, across platforms. Um, is there one more question? Oh. Just a question. Um, yeah. For Kristen, I'm wondering, um, you said you mentioned specific platforms, they're US-based platforms, and how certain platforms um, perhaps block certain hashtags. But I'm wondering if, if you looked at in your research or if you're interested in extending it into perhaps cultural differences, political, throughout the world where platforms and something like political censorship intersect and the work the workarounds that happen, for instance, in China with hashtag me too. Are we seeing cultural specificity about the kind of limitations and affordances of platforms themselves? Um, that's not something I investigated in this, and I, I certainly would be interested in doing so. I wanted to control the cultural context here to kind of be able to compare a little bit across um, experiences. Um, every survivor is obviously different and has their own goals in disclosing. Um, I would point, though, to the uh, Pierce VTech and BARDA piece um, that's about kind of visibility in an authorita authoritarian regime, um, such as Azerbaijan, and kind of the ways that people, again, negotiate visibility there and negotiate being reported um, in a context that has very real life implications, right? People go to jail for things they say on social media. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, that would be a place to start. Did you want to add to that? Okay. okay. And there was one more behind you, Paul. Yeah. Um, so um, I lost exactly how I was going to phrase this question, but this is for you, Kristen. Um, I guess uh, people tend to, I, I'm aware that um, in using various platforms, people um, become aware of certain types of algorithmic selection that happens with their posts. And um, for example, um, like I'm aware that Facebook prioritizes monumental life events such as like weddings and, and childbirth. Um, those things inevitably get promoted at the top of the feed, but that's not uh, like, that's an affordance you become aware of, but at the beginning it's invisible. And um, then there's another level at which um, engagement with posts, which you specifically mentioned, doesn't happen, also tends to promote things heavily. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how 
algorithmic selection, if, if there's like an awareness of this or how that factors into um, visibility as it's strategically. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, on Facebook, I'm less certain, but um, a couple participants mentioned um, kind of the algorithmic fuckery, for lack of a better term, on Instagram, um, and how Instagram has kind of shifted away from a chronological kind of sorting to, um, again, dealing with engagement and things like that. Um, and um, this was viewed um, in multiple ways by participants who mentioned it. And so you know, some were frustrated that that it wasn't getting out there, but some were often were kind of comforted by the fact that um, that maybe their posts were like a little bit more hidden unless someone deliberately searched for the terms that were tagged in there. Um, so I think there's more investigation that needs to be done into that, but that's certainly one of the structures that affects uh, visibility and is kind of subtly implicated in disclosure goals and the ways that people try to achieve those goals. Cool, and if I can ask oh, one last final thing. I think this is actually for Olga because I feel like in your in the context of your study, um, Kristen, there was like a lot of there's a strong sense of the value of this disclosure, and you closed with a very similarly positive note. But I wonder if you could just say a couple more words about it, in which you argue that these sorts of structures can lead to like a con contestation of military ideologies. Um, a lot of the examples you talked about were were about very practical action. Can you talk about how you're seeing this play out on a more ideological level or what the potential you see there is? Uh, so uh, I was just trying to see the relationship between the personal actions of individuals and the geopolitical outcome of those actions. And so if there is an uneven um, geopolitical situation when uh, Ukraine is getting occupied by a much stronger, much better prepared army, um, I was wondering uh, to what extent and how um, the civilians can participate in this military conflict so as to minimize the casualties and to prevent it from, uh, from spreading further. So theoretically, I was trying to use the notion of assemblage to show how different things come together in making this possible and how the personal actions such as um, going to make a small part of a masking net after work can contribute to this resistance by kind of uniting the efforts of, of many individuals through the media. Very interesting. And all of that, of course, is mediated by algorithmic fuckery and other sorts of um, so sorts of affordances. Um, well, this was a really interesting discussion. I'm glad we had the chance to talk more um, instead of just hearing the presentations. Thank you all for staying. Um, but I think we should convene a little early um, so people can catch the end of other discussions or get a cup of coffee. Um, I want to say a big thank you to our panelists and to the Museum of Moving Image for hosting us, um, which is a great institution, and it's really a pleasure to be here. So thanks to you all for staying as well. Round of applause. <laughs>